runs up like this and it loops all the way down towards the northern coast of California. Then it splits. And when it splits, it runs up into the Alaskan Bay, the Gulf of Alaska. It splits and it runs right here up along the Oregon coast. It goes like this and then it splits back down and goes down the California current. Right, the very swift. Contamination, if you were to go throw a rubber duck and caught that freaking river exactly right and it flowed right over, it can make it here in as short as five days. So I argue and I've been arguing, arguing with the University of Oregon, with Oregon State, with, I have whistleblowers coming to me from Cal Berkeley, where is the marine biology studies? Anybody who has any kind of logic, there are 300 marine biology departments, federally funded, taxpayer funded, 300. Wouldn't you think after 731 days we would have studies coming out saying yay or nay by now? Nothing, nothing, nothing. So I'm like, can a conspiracy or whatever you want to call it really be on this brand of a scale? Have they really bought off all the marine biology departments? Well, two days ago, coincide with the two year anniversary. Here comes this report which, by the way, I'm a social economist, so I watch the top 10, what makes Google top 10. This article would never make Google top 10 in a million years. It's right here. Here it is. Let me find it where I put it. Sorry. It's right here. Here it is, right here. This makes Google's top 10. Fukushima radiation proves less deadly than fear. And it goes on. This is the most grotesque written article that it's ever, there ever was by Robert Gill and Eric Lax, uh, Laxmar. So it goes on and on and on. I'm like, how do you get the top ten? Well, I know, social conscious, you can buy your way into any media outlet. About a half a million dollars. You, you want to you make Google's top ten on some kind of newsprint you got out? Spend a half a million dollars through these newswire services. It's there. So I started digging really deep into this study. Who are these people? Who are they? So who starts popping up? This group of so-called radiologists, so-called marine biologists start popping up. So I started really digging in at our university and with other people. Right here at Oregon State University. Then the light went on to me why these studies aren't out. I have her name, I have her email, I broadcast her. By the way, she is paid by Oregon taxpayer money. This is a state-funded university. You want to talk about a grotesque conflict of interest. I call them, you know, I hate to use the word, but I'll use it. I, you know, I, I call them nothing but IA's horrors. They work for the marine biology departments, and they're paid. And so I started digging into who these people were, and I give out these addresses. These people have names and addresses. You know, it's just like the Occupy and the Bank. We need to go right to their front lawns and call them out for these lies that they're doing. So the propaganda machine is in full, full flight. But so I'm giving all these reports on Fukushima. I'm going crazy. I'm going crazy. I'm lecturing all over. I'm just barely finishing up my PhD. I'm going livid. It's going to give you leukemia. It's going to be on October 13. I was heavily involved with the inception of the Occupy movement. I spent a lot of time in Manhattan, and I was trying to get catch fire on a social movement called Post Ignorance. I was trying to get it rolling, and I wanted to coincide it with the 100th anniversary of the Sheer Waste Fire, which happened March 25, 1911. I said, the writing's on the wall, it's exactly the same, which the shirtwaist building is building D at NYU. So I'd spent some time back there, I've been working with some people, they've been going back and forth with me on my YouTube site. Well, here comes 3 to live. You know, change the world. Occupy happened. It was going along. On October 13th, I got a stomach ache. I was standing on a table with a metal horn in my mouth. I thought I had food poisoning. It was intense, really intense. I went home and I'm like, it's getting worse. I'm a tough guy. I've had a broken back, severed tongue before. I'm a very tough guy. I tell, I always use the line, you think I was born with these scars across my face? It took years living in this violent place. I can use that tough ass place. Make no mistake about it, a very tough place, hard place. I'm a tough guy. The pain was so incredibly intense, I had to call an ambulance in the middle of the night. I showed up and I started to puke. And when I started to puke, it was brown. It almost looked like bowel movement. It was, it was horrific, horrific. And I, I knew, I knew, I think. So the ETNs are like, it's got to be your appendix. You know, and they're running, you know, they hurry and get me up to the hospital. And I started to calm a little bit. And I'll never forget it. 
I, I've seen the best of the best of the medical industry and the worst of the worst. In the early days for the first month, I've seen the worst doctors in the world. First doctor says, there's nothing wrong with you. And I'll never forget, I should have known. He told me, he says, you have an elevated white count. And I should have known, my expertise in this, I should have known, but I'm one of these guys, oh, this can't happen to me. You know, even though I know, you know, even while I watch my father, I watch so many people, even though I live there, and I know there, a lot of people get leukemia. I was in denial. Oh, it will never happen. I'm too tough. This can't happen to me. It'll never happen to me. This is to other people. Weaker people, not me. I'm too tough. You know, so I go home. The next day, I was even worse. I go back again. They sent me home again. I finally went up there and just had a fit and argued. And they finally CAT scanned me. And I'll never forget, I was watching the interview on the TV with Isaacson, who had written Steve Jobs' book. And he was talking about Steve Jobs refused to have the surgery. Because Steve Jobs really had the philosophy not to have his body open. Which, by the way, that, I have the same philosophy as Steve Jobs. I'm going to save my life. So I went in there, and I'll never forget, she comes in. I'm like, oh, it's not. I really thought I had listeria. It was during the listeria outbreak. I'm about, that's what it's got to be. I ate a lot of fresh cantaloupe. That's what it has to be. And they were saying it was showing up months later. She comes in, and she says, Kevin, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, what? And she says, you have a large mass down your lower right mesentery, and I've been, we've been reviewing it. We think it's carcinoid cancer. What is carcinoid cancer? She has me a Wikipedia page. We're going to admit you right now. I'm reading through the Wikipedia, headed up to my room, and I'm looking, and it says, it's totally curable. It's a slow-growth cancer, unless it is in your liver. If it has metastasized your liver, it's pretty well 100% death sentence. The only hope is radical surgery, and that works less than 1% of the time. So I'm waiting up there, and here comes the doctor, and he's not an oncologist, by the way, which there's about three or four doctors I've ever seen. I told my doctor in LDS at the Bone Marrow Transplant Center, these guys better hope I die, because if I live, there's about three or four, I'm going to knock them out. And so I'm standing there, and he comes in, and first question, is it in my liver? He says, Kevin, I've been reviewing it. There's a spot on your liver. And he looked right at me and he says, Kevin, you have all the symptoms. It's not good. You have dropping libido, which I, you know, they'd review and ask me all these people. Yes, I had. I had some numbness in my right arm. Yes, I had. I had some darkness in my stool. You know, I had all these symptoms that I had no idea. And he says, you have them all. This is not good. He says, I said, well, tell me, tell me. Don't lie to me. Tell me. I'm sitting there. It's on Friday afternoon. And I've since found that 85% of all leukemia die are leukemia that happen on Fridays, by the way, which is pretty crazy. So he says, my guess is you got two months. You know, and I, so I was just totally broke down. I watched my father die this horrible day. And by the way, it's an ugly, ugly, horrible death. I've watched it so many times now that I've been in this unit. It is horrible. So anyway, other doctors kept coming in and seeing me, and this went on and on and on. So they finally sent me home. And it was just getting worse. I was dropping five, six pounds a day. I went from 173 pounds to 129 pounds, less than a month, and I kept arguing and fighting. Well, finally, my knowledge, I, I'm a professor, and so I started running regression through my platform at the university on a 51-year-old male having metastasized carcinoid cancer, and the number was coming up ridiculous. Five million to one, seven million to one, eight million, you know, it didn't make sense to me. So I really started digging in. I really started, and I found a YouTube video that had 14 views. And it was a doctor from Cedar Sinai, a pathologist. And this pathologist had how this was so hard to diagnose. And in the meantime, the day before, they had biopsy. They went in and got a piece of it, which they never should have done. If you ever have leukemia, they're called de nouveau, do not let them open you because it seeds them. So I saw this, and my life went on. Well, I come from a family of doctors. My brilliant doctor, Dr. Thomas Blanchard, served on clinic. He's been dead for years. A brilliant, brilliant, amazing man. And I remember him telling me years ago, don't ever let them open leave unless you're going to die. So I finally got in to see the surgeon. And this guy was the biggest prick that ever walked. He was of Indian descent, young, American educated, UCLA Medical School. And I went in there and he says, who are you? And I said, what do you mean, who am I? I have an appointment, for God's sakes. Are you kidding me? And I was so shriveled up, almost dead. And he looked at me, and I says, is the pathology report in? And he says, let's look. And he looked on the computer, and he typed in, and he says, yeah, it's benign. And I says, thank you, God. And he says, no, 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 no. I'm looking at the wrong one, because they had scoped me and took a snip out of my son. 
Oh, I'm looking at a dog and towels to snip out of your stomach. It's clean. Now I could see the screen flashing. And he says, oh, no, it's not good. It's live, it's live. He says, it's about the livest I've ever seen. He says, we need to schedule you for surgery tomorrow. And he's got out of map. He says, I'm going to gut you from here to here. I'm going to take it all out and everything. And I'm like, no. I remember I argued with him. I said, you ain't doing that to me. You know, I says, where's the oncologist? Where's the oncologist? How come I haven't seen you guys as oncologists? In the meantime, I had drove to the Huntsman. In Utah, we have the, supposedly, with a wink and a nod, the greatest cancer units in the world, which is untrue. Huntsman Chemical, you know, they create an industry causing cancer. You know, John Huntsman. Now they have an industry treating cancer. Is it overcompensation? Um, I don't know, but they're phony. So I went down to see me. They're still suing me to this day for $1,200 for a phone conversation. And it's, they, they refused me until I handed over a check. I was not insured. I had had a fall in 2005, and I exhausted my insurance. I broke my back. You know, a horrible thing. So I was, I was in the uninsurable category, even, I, even though I was teaching. Even our university insurance would not insure me. So I had a 1,000 shares of Apple stock. So finally, I got in, thank God, for Dr. Hansen. He was my uncle's old business. He's an old, old man, very old man. And I knew his reputation was impeccable. And he was an hour late. I was, I was so scared. I went into this surreal state for just, I was just walking around. I was in so much pain. I told my daughter, I used to tell my da daughter, get the shotgun out of the, you know, the closet. Just blow my head off. I can't do it anymore. That's how painful it was. And so he looks at me and he says, I says, and I threw down some paperwork. And I says, this is my net worth. I have the ability to pay. I have the ability to pay. Don't treat me like this, you know? And I went crazy on him. He said, Kevin, I don't care if you have bill. He says, you're Kevin Blanche. And I said, yeah. He says, I know your work. You go off and say we're all down winners in Utah. He says, I've read a lot of your work. I know your work. I've listened to your lectures before. He says, you know, I agree. He says, my father and my brother both died of thyroid cancer. We grew up in central Utah. And he thought, he says, I'm glad you referred to me. He says, let me do some work. So he went to work, and his nurse told me that he argued with the pathologist, Silverman, who's supposedly the best pathologist in the state. He argued. And Silverman's like, no, I didn't get it wrong. I didn't get it wrong. He's like, I think maybe you got it. Well, in the meantime, I found this study, and I knew what de nouveau cancer was. People don't think that leukemia can form in tumors. They say it only happens one in 5,000 cases. I think that's radically wrong. I think it happens a lot. I found a study at the University of Texas on the internet who showed these studies that de novo cancer, and the worst thing you can do with de novo cancer, leukemia can form in tumors, and it can present in tumors. I know it sounds crazy and abstract, but it can. And I run this by Dr. Hansen, and he ran it, so they bone marrow biopsy me. By the way, those things hurt a lot. I've had multiple, multiple ones. They lay on your back and they go into your hip. And uh, the waiting for the results is much worse because it's liver died. And I showed very little contamination into my bone marrow. De Novo was the early presenter. I got lucky. I got lucky. I mean, I know it's hard to say you get lucky getting a cancer that kills 80% of people that get it, but I did get lucky by pushing in my lower. And he hypothesized, and he says, Kevin, you're going to LDS in the morning to the bone marrow transplant. Well, I knew what that meant. I just broke down. He says, no, 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 you don't know. There's a guy named Fimbo Peterson from Denmark. He's the world-class leukemia oncologist, maybe in the world, and he's formed this new unit. The Mormon Church doesn't own it. I said, I'm, you know, he said, it's under construction. I said, the dump's been under construction since I was a kid. I've worked on it multiple times. It's a piece of shit. I'm not going there. He's like, no, you are going there. Thank God I did. So I showed up there, and they have this world-class oncologist, and their motto when you walk in is if you want to eat the good food and stay in the hotel, go to the Huntsman. If you want to live, you come here. It's intense. There's only 33 rooms in there, and I mean, it is intense. The treatment is intense. So, get in there. They put a central line in me. They went into my spine, went into my brain stem. I mean, boom, boom, boom. They throw you in that room, and it is intense. And I'm here to tell you, I don't know if any of you ever been around somebody who's passed from leukemia, AML. It is a brutal, brutal, brutal war. It is the quintessential. It is the good fight on Balco. So I stuck it in there. They have rooms in there with tubes in there. It's an icy unit from hell. They quarantined me in there, and they basically kill you. They chemo you so hard, but they have, the central line was invented by Hickman at the University of Washington. That is what is the breakthrough in cancer, because they're able to feed you back and 
to have a protocol that's so intense in there. It is so intense, and their survival rates, you know, as high as maybe 50% when the rest of the world's like 20. So I, I went without food and water for other weeks. Well, the whole time I keep my YouTube vlog alive. I'm doing a lot of these radical, crazy videos that I do, and I go crazy, use all this strength, with a central line hanging. I, I was in critical condition for 269 days. I made the decision when I was laying in that bed that and I told all the doctors, I will not go down on a call third strike. I'm going down swinging. I don't care. I really felt that I probably was going to die, and I held on to it. I had a dream before, and I clung on to it, and I fought, and I fought, and I got angry, and I was working with some world-class cancer psychologists, and they're like, you get angry or die, I'm telling you right now. You get mad and you fight back. And I was already mad from the death of my father, and I hated the nuclear industry with a deep root of passion for the murder and the cover-up of the 40,000 atomic veterans. I hated them anyway. So that was how I kept myself alive. I took these creep monsters on, and I've taken them on in my YouTube site, my language and my ways are to try to wake up the masses on the left and the right. The American populace, this is the greatest conspiracy ever been perpetrated. We can all be eyes and we can live abstractly. They can take our money. They take, we can always find a way. You know, We can give up our shiny coffin driving back and forth. We can find a way to live with low money. But we have to have, we can't live without clean air. So I think it's ironic that this event happens on Pi 3.14 today. I think it's beautiful that I launched we launched this post-ignorance mantra of mine, I'm going to take this show on the road, because the earth is round, and we are all we, the jet stream doesn't allow us to live independently. I don't care if you're a farmer, I don't care if you're 100%, we still have to breathe the air. This is the greatest catastrophe in the history of man. Well, I still, my plate account, as you can see, I bruised myself real easy. It's I'm still very sick. My plate count is 111, but as I fought this, and I knew a lot about it, and I used to say I used to eat, sleep, drink it, now I sleep with it. Well, my YouTube site got a lot of attention. It was a very compelling story. Here's this guy ranting and raving, and people are saying he's the modern day Rachel Carson. And if any of you don't know who Rachel Carson was, she was the scientist who took on DDT single handedly, who's the greatest environmentalist in the history of the world. One single person. She hypothesized in Silent Springs that her book that, well, even she wrote books before, she was doing data saying that Dow Chemical is a conspiracy and they're giving women breast cancer and they're killing us. She took them on. She was compiling her data. And as she was compiling her data, she got the very thing that she was thinking. She got breast cancer. And they kept radiating, radiating, and it killed her. And that book became the number one selling book in America. And the American populace was outraged. And the American populace put an end to DDT, just like when the shirtwaist girls burned to death in 1911, all jumped out, the American populace was outraged and they gave us minimum wage and they gave us social movements. So my whole post-ignorance thing, we can do this. The only problem is there's plenty of experts out there and lots of people with great knowledge, always has been, but they have failed to bleed this into popular opinion. They have failed to get this to the populace. The populace has been oblivious to 40 years of nuclear waste. Let's not even talk about the reactors, the chance of a meltdown in the United States. When we have, if people knew the truth of how many times we've been that close to a nuclear disaster in the United States, and we've been that close multiple times. Sandy, when Sandy hit, I put out a call on my YouTube site two days before, and I said, batten down the hatches, Oyster Creek, Oyster Creek, Oyster Creek, Indian Point, Indian Point, Indian Point. We know that they're only built for a seven foot storm surge. We had a nine-foot storm surge. They said Oyster Creek came within that far of the storm surge to having a meltdown. Well, what, if you have a meltdown, the, just the evacuation alone is in the minimum 30 miles. And people make the mistake they don't realize, you never come back. If people know the truth of the contamination zone in Chernobyl, how giant it is, and it really should have been much, much bigger, just the removal of that real estate for time and all eternity 24,500 in the half-life. That's unmoxie fuel. In reality, it's 50,000 years. It's uninhabitable. It will kill you. Just in Japan alone, that precious real estate on that small island, just think about the contaminated zone. And we were told, oh, we have to have nuclear power. We have to have nuclear power. We have to have nuclear power. Oh, really? They shut them all down in Japan. They refired two. How many rolling blackouts have you seen in Japan? They come out and says, well, we think that maybe this summer that the Japanese populace will have to raise their thermostat to 83 degrees. Oh, God, what a tragedy. Go tell that to the 26th 
30th generation farmer in Fukushima, Japan, who's lost his land forever. Hey, you can have your land back, but you're going to have to turn your thermostat to 83 degrees this summer. So it's the nuclear lies and the 1%. This is the crowning jewel of the 1%. It is the greatest cash cow, literally, on Balco in world history. It is the mass, mass killer. Know this, Oregon, Washington, Canada, the United States, Fukushima will kill hundreds of thousands of times more people than it will ever kill in Japan, ever, because the wind was blowing out. And they pushed for it. Yeah, it's contaminated that area in Japan, not, but not like here. Well, how come we don't hear about it? RADNET. How many of you know what RADNET is? RADNET is the monitoring radiation. We spent billions post 9-11 because of a dirty bomb. We might have a dirty, but we, it was there in place before. We have monitoring devices in RADNET right here in this town at the University of Oregon, at Oregon State. So we're sitting there watching. Okay, we're going to be able to tell if it's going to come over here. Where, where are the data? Oh, RADNET just happened to not be working when Fukushima happens with a wink and a nod. It doesn't work. The new appointee to the EPA is a woman named Gina McCarthy. She's just been named, and she's going to be the appointment. I plan on going to Washington and protest. Who was head of RADNET when Fukushima happened? Gina McCarthy with a wink and a nod. So it's been freelancers all over Oregon or Washington. There are freelancers all over that have got Geiger counters who've went in. They're, they're the only data out there. All the sites come down. So. Day 14 after Fukushima happened, the NRC, the NRC is the Nuclear Regulatory Committee. I call them nuclear rallying cheerleaders. They're paid by you and I, taxpayer money, to protect us from these monsters. Well, they've been locked. They're, they're like the SEC to the bank on Balco. So, Harry Reid, we built, we built Yucca Mountain, by the way. Yucca Mountain is built. We spent billions of dollars building Yucca Mountain. Well, now that it's built in Nevada, Harry Reid's a senator from now. By the way, a Mormon from Utah who I know his family very well. That his contingency don't want that waste there. They don't want it there. So in order to get him reelected, he named Gregory Jacko to the head of the RC as a gift appointment. He has a lot of power. This is the highest ranking senator in the country. This is the second most powerful man in the world. So I like Gregory Jacko a lot, by the way. I think he's a man of integrity. I really liked him. He got called to the Situation Room. I have all this record, whistleblowers, and it's public knowledge, hiding in plain sight. When he went in there, and what happened behind those closed doors, we can only imagine. But we, we know that the Obama administration, by the way, I supported Obama both times. I'm very, very disappointed, very, very heartbroken. You know, as we say, send him a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin, not because he's black, because he smokes. Him and John Biner, both of them laugh at cancer. By the way, Barack Obama's mother was a downwinder. She died very young of cancer in Kansas. In Kansas, if you look at Richard Miller's map, how many, Kansas and Oklahoma took huge cancer rates from pros post the open air tests. So he, Jacko, you can see when he comes out. He was sanctioned. He spoke on the Hill within days, and you could see he wanted no part of this. He resigned. He said, I want to I want to talk now. I'm not going to participate in this dog and pony show. So, in the meantime, he's out. They name Allison McFarland. Well, I know Allison. I had a lot of hope for her. She's a geologist. But the only reason she was named, the only reason she was named, she wrote a book. She's a geologist. That there's an ancient river under Yucca Mountain. And it bleeds into the aquifer, which I think she's probably accurate. She's probably right, because there are no good answers now that we've let this madness go on for years. My number says 252. 252 are my numbers that I've done long before Fukushima dump sites in the United States. This waste is shoved everywhere. It's a shell game. Move it from here, 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 here. It's a joke. So he names her to block Yucca Mountain. So I've been going out with her back and forth in the NRC. And the, she's the only one who's anti. She is actually, well, she was anti-nuclear. So, he appoints her. So I've been going out, well, they're the only two options, shoot it into space or put it in Yucca Mountain. Really, they are the only two options. They keep saying, oh, science will catch up. Science is never going to catch up. Science will never catch up. As Einstein, Sokoroff, and, you know, do any of you know what the Tsar bomb is? The Tsar bomb was a bomb in the arms race 
to try to keep up with our bombs. The Tsar bomb was Andrei Sokarov's baby, who Andrei Sokarov was more expert than Einstein ever dreamed of being, then on side with the two-year anniversary. Here comes this report, which, by the way, I'm a socioeconomist, so I watch the top 10, what makes Google top 10. This article would never make Google's top 10 in a million years. It's right here. Here it is. Let me find it where I put it. Sorry. It's right here. Here it is, right here. This makes Google's top 10. Fukushima radiation proves less deadly than fear. And it goes on. This is the most grotesque written article that it's ever, there ever was by Robert Gale and Eric Lax, uh, Laxmar. It runs up like this and it loops all the way down towards the northern coast of California. And it splits. And when it splits, it runs up into the Alaskan Bay, the Gulf of Alaska. It splits and it runs right here up along the Oregon coast. It goes like this, and then it splits back down and goes down the California current. Right, the very swift. Contamination, if you were to go through a rubber duck and caught that freaking river exactly right, and it flowed right over, it can make it here in as short as five days. So I argue, and I've been hard to have her email. I broadcast her. By the way, she is paid by Oregon taxpayer money. This is a state funded university. You want to talk about a grotesque conflict of interest? I call them. You know, I hate to use the word, but I'll use it. I, you know, I, I call them nothing but IA's horrors. They work for the marine biology departments, and they're paid. And so I started digging into who these people were. And I give out these addresses. These people have names and addresses. You know, it's just like the Occupy and the Bank. We need to go right to their front lawns and call them out for these lies that they're doing. So the propaganda machine is in full, full flight. But so I'm giving an argument with the University of Oregon, with Oregon State, with, I have whistleblowers coming to me from Cal Berkeley, where is the marine biology studies? Anybody who has any kind of logic, there are 300 marine biology departments, federally funded, taxpayer funded, 300. Wouldn't you think after 731 days we would have studies coming out saying yay or nay by now? Nothing, 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 so I'm like, a conspiracy or whatever you want to call it, really be on this brand of a scale? Have they really bought off all the marine biology departments? Well, two days ago. So it goes on and on and on. I'm like, how do you get in the top ten? Well, I know, social conscious, you can buy your way into any media outlet. About a half a million dollars. You you want to you want to make Google's top ten on some kind of newsprint you got out? Spend a half a million dollars through these newswire services. It's there. So I started digging really deep into this study. Who are these people? Who are they? So who starts popping up? This group of so-called radiologists, so-called marine biologists start popping up. So I started really digging in at our university with other people. Right here at Oregon State University. Then the light went on to me why these studies aren't out. I have her name, 